Income tax 2023-2024. Inventory, uniform capitalization rules and changes in accounting method. Get ready and some coffee because you're supporting an entire generation with your income tax preparation 2023-2024. Most of this information can be found in publication 334 Tax Guide for Small Business for Individuals Who Use Schedule C Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at the income tax formula, the first half of the income tax formula basically being a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. This sole proprietorship Schedule C rolling into line one income, which is a little funny because the Schedule C itself is also an income statement in essence having business income minus business expenses which you could call business deductions resulting in essence in net business income rolling in from the schedule c to line one income on the income tax formula representing the formula on the form 1040 this being the first page of a form 1040 the schedule c ultimately rolling into line number eight additional income from schedule one this is the schedule one additional income and adjustments first a word from our sponsor yeah actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers they don't want to be seen with us but but that's okay whatever because our merchandise is is better than their stupid stuff anyways like our crunching numbers is my cardio product line now i'm not saying that subscribing to this channel crunching numbers with us will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So, you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise. So you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com to Income Part 1, where the Schedule C rolls into Line 3, Business Income or Loss from the Schedule C. Here is a Schedule C profit or loss from business having the P&L profit and loss or income statement format of an income minus expenses. So now we're continuing on with our discussion of accounting methods given the fact that the Schedule C is of course a type of financial statement in essence, basically an income statement as opposed to the other major type of financial statement, the balance sheet and it is representing performance over a time frame. Therefore, we need to have some kind of accounting that we're going to be doing in order to guide us in terms of how we're going to be putting the income statement together. Our regulations come from the tax code, but of course the tax code might be deferring to standard kind of accounting regulations and authorities. The primary two types of methods we use, cash method, and accrual method or possibly some kind of hybrid between them, noting that the major things that would push us from going from a cash method, the easier method typically, to an accrual method are when our business, our industry have accrual type of things we need to deal with, such as inventory, because it's gonna go on the books as an asset typically when we purchase it, which is a deviation from a cash-based accounting thing to do. And when we buy large things, like property, plant, and equipment. In that case, even if on a cash-based system, we would have to put it on the books basically as a balance sheet or on the tax return as a depreciable asset, allocating the cost in accordance with the depreciation rules, that also being a de deviation from a cash-based system. All right, so uniform capitalization rules. Under the uniform capitalization rules, you must capitalize the direct cost and part of the indirect cost for pr production or resale activities. So when we think about capitalization in this context, what we're talking about typically is putting something on the books rather than as an expense, as an asset. In other words, 
Usually when we buy things, when we're thinking about our accounting process, when the money is going out of our checking account, it's because we're purchasing things and normally we just expense them when we pay for them, such as the utility bill, the phone bill, supplies, for example. But we have some of those things, usually the large purchases and then the inventory, where when we purchase them, the money goes out and we, instead of expensing them, put them on the books as an asset. We can call that basically capitalizing them, putting them on the books as an asset. And they're on the books as an asset because we're not getting the consumption of them that's helping us to generate revenue in the current period, but rather we're in basically investing in something. We're investing in the inventory. We're investing in the property, plants, and equipment, the depreciable assets, which will help us to generate revenue into the future. Therefore, under an accrual method, we would want to be expensing them as we consume them rather than when the cash was paid for them. So include these costs in the basis of property you uh, produce or acquire for resale uh, rather than claiming them as a current deduction. So rather than expensing them, we have to put them on the books in essence as an asset and then expense them in the future in the form of depreciation for fixed assets or in the form of cost of goods sold for the inventory. You recover the costs through depreciation, amortization, or cost of goods sold when you use, sell, or otherwise dispose of the property. So if it's inventory, we buy it, we typically put it on the books as an asset, inventory, then we get the expense when we sell it in the form of cost of goods sold. If it's a depreciable property, we put it on the books as equipment or something like that, an asset, then we get the expense when we depreciate it. Amortization would be intangible things that have a similar capacity or uh, process as with tangible depreciable property, amortizing them over the useful life instead of depreciating them. Same concept though. Activities subject to the uniform capitalization rules. You may be subject to the uniform capitalization rules if you do any of the following unless the property is produced for your use other than in a business or an activity carried on for profit. So produce real or tangible personal property. For this purpose, tangible personal property includes film, sound recording, videotape, book, or similar property, acquire property for resale. So if we're producing something, you would think that as we produce it, we're producing it in order to sell it. So it might be something that would be capitalized basically as inventory. If we acquire something, then clearly it's gonna be inventory because we purchased it in order to uh, sell it in the future. And the idea there being that instead of expensing it at the point in time we purchase it or expensing it as the point in time that we consume costs in order to make the thing that we're making, we're basically making the inventory or the thing that we're going to sell, we're instead going to put it on the books as an asset and then expense it when we sell it in the form of cost of goods sold, you would think. Exceptions. These rules do not apply to the following. So we always have that small business taxpayers defined earlier under inventories where we might have an exception. So inventories, once again, an area that could cause us problems, forcing us to deviate from a cash basis to an accrual basis. However, there could be some exceptions, therefore, uh, especially for small businesses. When you're dealing with inventory, you want to think pretty well in depth about how exactly is my business going to work logistically and what is going to be the tax basis that would be best for me. And not only in the current year, but also kind of thinking forward in terms of, is this going to lead me to have to change my accounting method in the future, which is kind of a pain and we have to ask permission for typically or follow certain rules to do so. And we'd like to make it as easy as possible, being consistent if we can. Property uh, you produce in your indirect cost of producing the property are $200,000 or less. So uh, special methods. There are special methods of accounting for certain items of income or expense. These include the following. Amortization discussed in chapter seven. So we'll get into like depreciation and types of assets later. And then of course, amortization are gonna follow their own kind of rules, which are basically separate from what you might expect. You might expect the tax code to say, hey, we'll just default to accounting principles, generally accepted accounting principles. And they kind of do that, 
but then they deviate from that for other reasons, which are probably lobbying type reasons and so on, where they're trying to accelerate the depreciation methods. Therefore, the depreciation rules that we go to for taxes may differ than normal best practices for accounting. And that's another area where things get a bit messy. So bad debts discussed under topic number four, uh, five, three, bad debt deduction. We might talk about that later. Depletion discussed in chapter seven of publication 225. So depletion is kind of a special area that might be in certain types of industries. So for example, if you have an oil well or something like that, well, now you you don't just have a building that's going to depreciate over time. You have a, an, an asset that you have to estimate. You would think how much is there? How much oil is under the ground? What's the value of it? And then obviously you should be able, if you were able to have the knowledge of how much was there, you can then calculate as you as you extract it, you know, how much has been depleted and so on and so forth in that valuation. So that would be a special area. A uh, depreciation discussed in publication 946, how to depreciate property. Now, many small businesses, if you are a like a gig worker or something, you might not have a whole lot of property that you have to deal with depreciation with. And these days you might be able to depreciate most of it in the year that you buy it, like microphones and stuff if you're a YouTuber or something, because of the special rules for accelerated uh, depreciation that could come in place. But depreciation typically is something that affects more small businesses, meaning if you buy larger pieces of equipment, you're going to have to deal with depreciation. Depreciation causes all kinds of problems because it's more complicated than simply a cash-based system. We have to track all the records for the depreciation, and then it really kind of becomes a problem when we dispose of property or sell property because then we have to deal with the, the adjusted costs. We have to deal with the fact that we depreciated part of it. Is there any difference in the type of tax rates in terms of capital gains versus ordinary income when we sell it? And those kind of questions come up with regards to depreciation. So it's often, even for small businesses, kind of an area of complication. There's also could be differences between depreciation methods for taxes versus bookkeeping, which we talked about earlier in terms of best practices for bookkeeping versus what the tax code says we need to do according to the tax code. So we'll talk about depreciation in some detail uh, later, uh, although again, depreciation is a place that you can dive into for some time. So installment sales discussed in publication 537 installment sales. So that's a, a type of sales structure that, ha that could be set up and there could be special rules with regards to installment sales, which again would be somewhat of a of a uh, unusual situation, but not that unusual that those types of sales could come up. And then how would you recognize rec revenue within them? Long-term contract methods of accounting, see uh, section 460. So if we have a, a long-term contract, again, the, the long-term contracts could complicate things like revenue, revenue, uh, generation principles and some industries that are engaged in them could be specialized areas. So like construction, for example, might be an area of specialization due to differences in accounting uh, methods and therefore tax treatment often as well. So change in accounting method. Once you have set your accounting method, you must generally get IRS approval before you can change to another method. A change in your accounting method includes uh, a change in number one, the overall method such as, uh, such as from cash to an accrual method. So one of the core concepts of accounting in general is consistency it, because we want to be able to make comparisons year over year. So when we think of accounting, we're typically thinking internal decision making from management as well as external decision making for people like investors who are using financial statements to try to invest in like stocks, stocks, for example. So that in that case, I want comparable performance statements year over year, consistency in the company so I can compare year over year as well as consistency across companies so we can compare one company to another. So if we choose one method and then we were able to change it all the time, 
then the tax code for taxes, you would think that people would use that manipulation to change the cutoff dates to try to reduce taxes. Obviously, the IRS is not going to like that. And therefore, you're going to need to keep a particular method unless there's a rationale for it, in which case you have to get approval by the IRS. Now, with a cash to an accrual method, you can imagine the IRS might be okay with that in some cases because you're usually going to a more complex method and sometimes you might need to, such as if you didn't have inventory before and now you do have inventory or you were a small business before and you've grown to a larger business and now you need to track your inventory in a more specific way for whatever reason. So there are rationales when it could happen, but you're gonna get approval for it or need approval and what you really want to make sure that you do is not mess up the first Schedule C and choose the wrong accounting method, in which case you need to change the accounting method, not because you've grown, not because you've changed the type of business, not because you've included inventory, but because you messed up and that could end up being a problem. You might be able to, you know, you could try to amend the prior return or something like that. But again, you want to avoid that problem too. Uh, your treatment of any material item. So when we think about material, we're not talking about like a physical thing you can touch. We're talking about it has a tang it has a impact on decision making or the amount of tax that's going to be paid. It's not immaterial with regards to the taxes and the taxes that will be paid. So to get approval, you must file form 3115. So what if I want to change my method? I have to get approval. We got form 3115. Uh, you can get IRS approval to change an accounting method under either the automatic change procedures or the advanced consent request procedures. You may have to pay a user fee, and that's always not fun to pay a fee, but that's part of the process. For more information, you can see instructions for Form 3115. So if you need to make that change, IRS website, take a look at the Form 3115 and the related instructions for it. Automatic change procedures, what's it look like? Certain taxpayers can presume to have IRS approval to change their method of accounting. The approval is granted for the tax year for which the taxpayer requests a change, year of change, if the taxpayer complies with provisions of the automatic change procedures. So obviously one of the issues with making these changes is the time it takes to get approval, which can be a stressful type of process. And you have to do some accounting basically in the meantime. So you would like to possibly able to qualify for the automatic change procedure. So you can basically assume that the change will be accepted, right? Because if it's not accepted and then you made the change and your bookkeeping has changed and so on and so forth, and then they reject it and then you have to appeal it or whatever is going to go on, that's going to cause havoc to your bookkeeping and tax preparation. So no user fee is required for an application filed under an automatic uh, change procedure generally covered in Revenue Procedure 2015-13-2015-5 IRB-419, which is available at the IRS website. Generally, you must file Form 3115 to request an automatic change. Again, for more information, see the instructions for Form 3115, which you can find on the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov.